Okay, thanks. So I'm going to start off by categorising um, forest um, goods and services, and then I'm going to look at um, how we've adopted over the last 20 years an unconventional approach to global forest governance in as much as despite um, demands from several actors, there is no global forest convention. So the global forest governance has evolved outside of a hard legal framework dedicated exclusively to forests. Despite this, I'll be suggesting that an international forest regime has emerged um, that's multi-centric and it's got several different legal sources scattered over a broad array of international organisations. I then talk a little bit about the findings from the UFRO Global Forest Expert Panel on the International Forest Regime, which Geraldine mentioned. I was a member of that panel, along with um, Yerdi. We cooperated together in the writing of Chapter 2 of that report. And I then look at four causal pathways between global governance and local forest management regimes. Now, before I um, entered academia, I had a, had a very different career. Oh, I've done it again. Uh, this is right. I'm gonna have to. Sorry, I'll have to watch that. It's different. Yeah, just this one. Okay. And I worked at sea on this ship, um, British cruise ship, the the Queen Elizabeth II, the QE2. I worked on that for three years, and I want to start where my my second book, Logjam, begins, and it begins in the Venezuelan port of La Guara. Now, from about a mile out at sea. Um, people sailing into La Guara are greeted by what at first sight appear to be holiday homes overlooking the Caribbean. But as you get closer, it's clear that these are in fact uh, slums, the barrios of the dispossessed living on the margins of the global economy. And for those who disembark and take the road into Caracas, the scene is very much the same. Now, in December 1999, huge rainfalls washed many of the barrios off the hills and into the valleys of coastal Venezuela. And across a whole swathe of the country, it's estimated that up to 30,000 people died. Okay, so this is a huge tragedy, which happened, I'd suggest, because of deforestation on the hillsides. And while the forests were there, they served a soil conservation function, um, keeping the soil bound to the mountains. But when the forests were cleared away, nobody in the vicinity could escape the consequences. While most of the costs were borne by the poor, the rich in the valleys did not escape the consequences either. And I think this illustrates the different public goods and services that forests can provide at different scales. And it led me to use this categorisation of goods um, to uh, uh, divide the various goods and services that forests provide. Economists amongst you will be familiar that goods can be seen as excludable if somebody has property rights and can exclude other people from using these goods and rivalrous if one person's consumption of a good means that there's less left for others. Forests provide a wide range of private goods. You won't need me to, to explain what they are. There's also different club goods. Uh, in particular, the patents on the properties of forest species, including patents on the rights of traditional forest-related knowledge, which actors can only use if they pay a royalty to um, the patent holders. So that's a club good. In quadrant three, res nullius or open access goods, which are rivalrous but non-excludable, uh, Harding's uh, tragedy of the commons, goods that are open to degradation through overuse, and finally, and arguably most importantly, are public goods or forest ecosystem services, soil conservation as we've seen in Venezuela, but also other goods and services such as watershed management, biological diversity that contributes to ecosystem resilience, sites of local cultural and spiritual value, and so on. And I think what this illustrates is that forests are shared not in a spatial or ownership sense, but in the sense that we've all got a stake in forest management and how forests are managed affects each and every one of us. And I think this has, uh, raises some fundamental questions about forest governance. Who has the responsibility and authority to maintain forest public goods? And how should the costs and benefits be allocated amongst the different actors that benefit from uh, these goods? 
at what scales should action take place? Should it take place at the local level, the regional level, the global level? And I think there's a recognition that, it, that, that action should take place at different spatial scales because the benefits of forest public goods accrue at different spatial scales. And that leads on to a final question, how should we achieve multi-level coordination between these scales? And these questions animate the debate on how effective forest governance should be constructed. And they'll be recurring uh, in, in my talk over the next 15 minutes or so. As I said, there's been various um, calls for a forest convention over the years. I'd like to hypothesise that there's five clusters of argument um, why some states have argued for a forest convention and why some states have argued against. And clearly there's no consensus either for or against, and that's why the debate keeps arising. On forest management standards, some states that have got high forest management standards may favour a convention in order to raise the forest management standards of other states. States with high standards will accrue costs that states with low standards do not accrue. I think this might explain the consistent demand for a forest convention from Canada, which has been the most persistent advocate for a convention over the last 20 years. But again, some states with low management standards may oppose a convention, as this may impose additional costs on their industry. On finance and technology transfer, these twin issues arise again and again in international forest negotiations. They are consistently on, uh, on the agenda at the UNFF. Some tropical states may favour a convention as it may lead to increased flows of financial and technological aid. But against this, many developed states who are expected to supply these resources might oppose a convention as it, as it might lead to increased costs for them uh, in, in aid flows uh, from uh, developed to developing states. A third set of argument is on, uh, revolves around sovereignty. Some developed states may support a convention as it may give them some measure of control over the forest policies of other states. But against this, some tropical states might oppose a convention, fearing that it could constitute an infringement on their sovereignty, their sovereign right to exploit their natural resources. And I think this is a recurring concern of Brazil and the other Latin American states. On, moving on to a sort of more morally based argument uh, for a forest convention, some states might support a convention for intergenerational reasons, to conserve forests for future generations. But against that, rather cynically perhaps, we might suggest that some states will oppose a convention with a strong conservationist ethos, as, bluntly put, the interests of future generations may conflict with elite interests in the present. And finally, on, on forest industry, some states may favour a convention as it would be a mechanism to promote the international trade in forest products, while others might oppose a convention as it might uh, erect regulatory barriers uh, to forest, the forest industry. So I think what this shows is that there's, while there's been various demands for a convention, there's not really been a firm uh, vision on what a convention could can, can it could uh, have a strong conservationist focus or it could have a focus on the forest product industries. Taking, going back now to the dark ages, some 20 years ago, before the internet, before iPods, uh, the Unksaid forest negotiations uh, was, saw the, 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 the emergence of forests as a global issue on the international stage for the very first time. Before that we had the Tropical Forestry Action Programme and ITTO, but they had a tropical only focus. So this is the first time that forests as a global issue uh, emerged. Um, now, north-south distinctions are often overstated in international forest politics. Um, but I think here, in, at, the, at Rio, uh, the, the distinction holds true. There was a, a very much a north-south battle, with the north going to Rio promoting um, issues that could be framed as global. Its concerns were global warming. Biodiversity was seen as a, as a, as a global issue. Deforestation. But the emphasis for the South was very much on local environmental problems that affect um, the, the people of, of, of countries in Latin America, Africa and Asia, such as poverty, soil erosion and the lack of access to clean drinking water. 
The countries of the north uh, sought to link the principle of sovereignty with stewardship, arguing that countries with forests should steward them, should look after them um, on behalf of the international community, the global community, if you like. And they link this also with the idea that there's a common responsibility. The South didn't like this link, these linkages. They said it interfered with sovereignty. They said that sovereignty was a standalone principle that should not be compromised by being linked to other principles. They rejected the notion of stewardship and they said that instead of talking of common responsibility, we should talk of common but differentiated responsibility. Now, while at Rio that principle was written into the Framework Convention on Climate Change, in Article 3.1, it did not make it into the Statement of Forest Principles, though it's since been written into the non-legally binding instrument of 2007. Different views on financial transfers, uh, which I've already mentioned, and on technology transfers. So from this, these different negotiating positions distilled different preferences. A forest convention, said the countries of the North, no, but we will accept a non-legally binding statement of forest principles, said the countries of the South. So that was the compromise position. So the positions on the Global Forest Convention have changed quite a bit throughout the years. UNCSED was the first time that we considered this issue. The non-governmental organisations that, that lobbied uh, at Rio, is fair, I think it's fair to say that there was no clear NGO position, but in as much as there was a sort of majority position, it was that a convention was acceptable, providing that it contained strong conservation commitments and um, clauses on the uh, respecting the rights of, of indigenous peoples. By the time we get to the IPFF, the Intergovernmental Panel on Forests, revisited this question in 1997. There's been some changes. The countries of Africa uh, are now divided for and against. The Francophile countries have tended to emerge in favour of a convention. Uh, the countries of Central America have also uh, tended to emerge in favour of a convention. And incidentally, the one of the main axes of conflict um, in international forest politics is between Central America, which now favours a convention, and South America, which remains resolutely against. And in 2006, this, um, this disagreement actually led to the temporary breakup of the group of 77 um, developing countries at the UNFF. The United States and Japan are no longer in favour of a convention. Uh, Malaysia, which is one of the strongest proponents against the convention at Rio, is now in favour, and that was due to a shift in the uh, moval of responsibility for forests from the foreign ministry in Malaysia, which took a sort of strategic overview of forests, perhaps as, as a security issue, to the Ministry for Primary Industries. And that's pretty much where we're at now. There's been uh, no real change in the constellation of interest since then. Perhaps in the main change is in the European Union, where some governments, such as Sweden and the United Kingdom, have, have said, well, actually, we're not really that much in favour of a convention. And um, with the result that the, U the European Union has struggled sometimes to synthesise a common negotiating um, position. So that's the, co the convention debate. We don't have one. When Nick's going to re revisit this issue in 2015, where I venture to suggest there will be no uh, consensus once again. So that means that um, efforts to construct global forest governance have had to take place outside a convention. This shows outside of a hard legal framework of a convention. This shows the position within the United Nations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Forests and its successor, the Intergovernmental Forum on Forests, both of which reported to the Commission on Sustainable Development. The UNFF has a, has a higher profile role and it reports directly to the ECOSOC. So since the creation of the UNFF, Forest has had a higher profile visibility within the United Nations system than it has ever had. Um, no longer reporting to the CSD, although the CSD continues to consider um, forest related um, issues. Despite this, I would suggest that a forest regime has emerged, okay, and that it's founded upon three sources of international law. There's hard international law of forest related processes such as the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol, which mentions sustainable forest management, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species has uh, listed uh, some uh, tree species, 
uh, such, such as big leaf mahogany on Appendix 2 and the Convention to Combat uh, Desertification. Then there's a body of soft international law on forests and then there's private international law which, which the FSC and the, P, the PEFC can be seen as falling under. So there's an emerging body of soft law on forests and the, the first was there was the Forest Principles of Rio in Chapter 11 uh, of Agenda 21. The IPF and the IFF proposals for action uh, contain some 270 discrete proposals um, of uh, actions that states could take at the local level, including the formation of national forest um, programmes. There's been a series of UNFF resolutions since 2001, and I've already mentioned the non-legally binding instrument of 2007. So there is, there is a regime of sorts, but unlike most sort of international environmental regimes, it does not have a single hard law focus. It's multi-centric. As I say, it's, it covers a range of hard and soft and private um, instruments. It's not a coherent regime. Uh, there are sort of inconsistencies, gaps, duplications within it. But nonetheless, it has, I would suggest, had a normative pull on the behaviour of states and other actors. And then, as I say, the UFRO Global Forest Expert Panel on the International Forest Regime uh, met to consider this, uh, this, this, this question and to synthesise the literature on the regime. And uh, this met, we met twice in Vienna uh, in uh, 2009 and then in Nairobi last year. Um, Geraldine's already mentioned the report. I'm going to focus in particular um, on how the international forest regime may impact now upon the local level and local forest management regimes. So uh, this is drawing from the work of um, Ben Cashaw and Stephen Bernstein, two colleagues who worked with us on the panel. And they argue that there are four causal pathways between global environmental regimes and local forest regimes. And the first is the international rules pathway. Now, the logic of this pathway is that international rules can shift the behaviour of governments and other actors, that there's a pull towards compliance, so that even soft law can uh, change behaviour. You don't necessarily need to have hard law. The, the, the uh, recommendations, for example, of the IPF, IFF proposals for action have had a, uh, some led to some changes in behaviour. But what the panel found is that there is no direct causal relationship, as may be suggested in some parts of the literature, between international rules and local forest regimes. International rules have a bearing on what happens at the local, the local level, but they interact with the other three causal pathways. Okay? And international rules never arrive, if you like, at the local level intact they always collide, if you like, with local social and economic situations, with local cultures and so on. So international rules are mediated in a way that, that fits local cultural and socio-economic context. Is that one minute? Oh dear. <clears throat> I'm just warming up. Um, OK, I'm going to have to have to get a bit of a move on now. Um, and ways in which international rules have, have uh, impacted upon the local level include national forest programmes, criteria and indicators for sustainable forest management. Some countries have established CITES national authorities uh, to implement CITES regulations at the national level. And FLEG can be seen as a, a, a mechanism that's established international rules at the local level. Moving on, the second causal pathway is the norms and discourses pathway. Okay, so international norms and rules w uh, can shape um, actors' behaviour. Uh, these are some of the discourses that, that we see uh, within uh, global forest governance. It's been framed as a sustainable forest management issue, a biodiversity issue. A good governance issue with uh, concepts that, that we find in the good governance literature, inclusiveness and participation, transparency, accountability and equity. The idea that um, uh, costs and benefits should be shared sort of fairly and equally amongst actors and that some actors should not have bear most of the costs while other actors derive most of the benefits. And, uh, 
forest is often framed as a, a human rights issue and groups such as the World Rainforest Movement, uh, the Third World Network and other, and other um, campaigning actors uh, such as Yerdi's group have helped make sure that the visibility of this issue doesn't disappear, backed by major international NGOs such as WWF and, and IUCN. So discourses um, uh, can shape how um, uh, lo in, in local forest management regimes evolve. Um, I've tracked the concept of the community of, co of community, the concept of community conserved areas, uh, which is based on the idea that communities relate culturally to ecosystems and species, and that primary decision making should rest with communities. And tracked how this concept emerged and then be and spilled through various different forums. It began within the IUCN. Uh, it then uh, was adopted by um, an expert group on protected areas of the CBD. In 2003, the World Parks Congress in Durban adopted in its Durban Action Plan the idea of community conserved areas. It was then adopted by the CBD Substa and finally made it into the programme of protected areas adopted by the CBD in February 2004. Now that's just one example. My point here is that discourses and principles matter when they spill over from one forum into another. If a, if a principle is mentioned in just one international legal declaration, it might not have much normative force. But when it gets repeated and reiterated amongst the whole raft of declarations and um, uh, political outputs, then it will increase in its normative force and will have more of a bearing on shaping actors' behaviours. The, the discourse of neoliberalism, is, it can be argued, is something that uh, tends to uh, incline towards certain types of policy uh, solutions, such as those that are consistent with trade liberalisation, market-based solutions, co voluntary codes of conduct and privatisation. And with national legislation and, and hard international law on forests not really being the favoured mechanisms. Now, what I don't mean to suggest there is that we never have national legislation on forest-related issues, but what I do mean to suggest is that the inclination will be more towards voluntary and market-based solutions rather than hard regulation. Um, I'm going to skip this because we're nearly out of time. This is Evo Morales. Um, in 2009, when working at the United Nations Forum on Forests, I heard that Evo Morales was talking in the General Assembly. Uh, my pass enabled me to actually get into the General Assembly, and I saw Evo Morales make a declaration uh, supported by the General Assembly of, for an International Mother Earth Day on the 22nd of April each year, in which he said the rights of the Earth should be respected, that the Earth has rights. Now, what I would suggest is this, this is an embryonic discourse, an embryonic jurisprudence, if you like, that is coming out of Latin America. This idea that the earth has rights, okay, is something that we might hear more of in the years ahead, because another Latin American country, Ecuador, has adopted it and said that, the, that there are rights for nature and that every person, people, community or nationality should be able to demand that these rights be recognised before public um, or uh, bodies. The third um, pathway uh, that, that from the global forest regime uh, and global forest governance more broadly defined to the local level is the markets pathway. Uh, market incentives such as taxes and subsidies, certification, the genius of, of the, the FSC and forest certification is that it works through neoliberalism's favoured mechanism, the market. It works through the, the, the market, the supply chain of a private good to promote the conservation of, of forest public goods. Green procurement policies, we've seen a lot of that recently as a spin-off of the FLEG process and tradable emission permits also working through market mechanisms. And finally, there's the direct access to domestic policy pathway in which actors can, uh, both non-governmental, um, Yerdi's recently been working in Myanmar, uh, this is, that's just one example, uh, governmental organisations working through um, their aid agencies to develop partnerships with local communities, building networks, capacity building, education and training, offering financial assistance and even sometimes NGOs uh, working 
uh, in, on independent forest monitoring, such as Global Witness in uh, Cambodia. I know that arrangement ended in tears, but it's nonetheless a, a fascinating example of how NGOs can take on um, functions that are normally seen as the prerogative of states. So the direct access pathway has to navigate cons concerns on sovereignty and external interference. But if it can successfully do that, this is an important way in which um, uh, change can be introduced on the ground. So these four pathways uh, intersect. As I say, there's rarely a direct relationship between international rules and local forest management. These pathways intersect in ways that are often quite poorly understood. Some initiatives will work with more than one pathway. Indeed, the most effective initiatives do this. FLEG, for example, works through the market. It works through capacity building in different countries. It works through international rules. I think this is one of the reasons why FLEG is so, uh, so far successful, because it works through different mechanisms. A, a conclusion of the expert panel was that a forest convention is not the way forward, that too much political oxygen, if you like, has been invested in trying to drive forward top-down solutions, and that instead we should recognise complexity and work with it, try to harness complexity towards the goal of forest conservation and sustainable management and to eliminate the inconsistencies at the local level. And finally, a recommendation came out of the panel on the, 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 there should be a, on the concept of forests plus. Now, this is a conceptual cousin, if you like, of red plus. The earlier notion of red was vulnerable to the accusation that it was focusing on just one forest public good, namely the carbon sequestration function of forests. The solution, well, let's have red plus, which focuses on other forest public goods and which is focused on sustainable forest management more broadly defined. Forest Plus argues that instead of just focusing on forest governance, it's necessary to broaden our focus uh, to look at all forest-related interactions. Okay, to look at, um, for example, the agricultural sector on urbanisation and to have a more holistic, intersectoral focus on forests uh, which will capture the, uh, the, and, and work with the complexity of forest management uh, in, in a more synergistic and holistic way. So I think that's the main conceptual contribution of the expert panel and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.